Hi, everybody. I am when you're back. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. And tonight, of course, I have Sharon and Laura Wilsey. And as usual, it's some craziness that's going on. So welcome. <laughs> thank you for joining us. If I blip out, I'm on the McDonald's internet connection. And it keeps cutting out. So um, you guys will just keep rolling. Okay. We'll do this together. We've no, we know how to do this. Yeah, all right. All right. Take it away, Sharon and Laura. <laughs> So Howdy. We had previously talked, you and I, about, um, you know, let's let's analyze uh, an, an interesting facet of horse behavior that I um, I work with all the time, and and it's it's such an interesting thing from a, from a science perspective, you know, from a you know really studying animal behaviors or or from an ethological perspective. So, um, really encountering equines as their own species rather than how we usually think of them as, you know, this or my horse or, the, you know, these thoughts and ideas about them. But one of the things that really stands out, the more that we decode their body language, the more uh, evidence there is that their body language is so dependent upon the, also the, the communication in the group of horses because they're a herd animal. And it's hard for us to really relate to that even though technically humans, we, we thrive in packs as well, you know, but we have um, eyes in front loves to hunt and horses have eyes on the side loves to hide. So horses being <clears throat> a herd animal, it's also a prey animal. They have some fundamental differences in how they organize themselves, how they think about their world, what they're doing in the world as they move through it. And so some of those things are the foundational reasons why are we getting conflicts with them? And <clears throat> the thing that uh, Wendy, you and I were thinking of talking about tonight was if you think about horses from the group mind, meaning that they consider themselves a part of a group, kind of like a hive mind, like bees are out independently getting nectar from different flowers, but they're connected to the hive mind and they all you know, think of themselves as a collection, even though they're singularities. So we're singulars. So if we think about horses a bit like that, when, you know, we just did some filming today of our horses going between a couple of different environments and how the patterns that they take as they move through those environments, which are very predictable patterns, they're repeatable, um, therefore they're learnable and teachable. And it's not just our herd, it's herds in general. And even though domestic horses have different lifestyles, they have different experiences, sometimes they're kept isolated, this is still the nature of the horse. It's still what's natural inside that horse brain, what they were designed by nature to be like. So yes, they can be taken out and live in isolation and all kinds of things, but given a chance to live in some, some kind of uh, nominal herd life, there are patterns that are so predictable and repeatable. So when you understand some of those patterns, it can help us, A, understand why horses do what they do that we don't like, and B, help to problem solve some of the issues that we have with our horses because we have to step outside of our way of seeing the world, which is predatory. Whether or not we're hunting, you could even be a vegetarian, it doesn't matter. It's the nature inside of people to go for something. So we have the, and we get a dopamine hit when we find it, you know, whether it's, ooh, there's the deer I want to hunt or, ooh, there's a blueberry on a bush. Either way, we're still like, ooh, there it is. I'm going to go get it. Whereas horses' eyes are designed differently. They're, they're prepared to live in a much more peripheral way than we are. They see their eyes function totally different than our eyes function. Their relationship to the world is different than our relationship to the world. They don't need to hunt food, foods on the ground. They need to be aware of hunters and get away from them. So our, our, our very way of moving through the world, just walking on earth, can be so substantially different that um, once I help people to understand those differentials, it can really help people a, to understand what their horse is experiencing and B, problem solve. So one of the things that I'm really fascinated in is watching more and more herd dynamics. And hopefully, Wendy, and I hope that you go with me, um, I got the heads up that there is a Grevy's Zebra Preserve in Florida. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, PJ told me about that. And she said we could get tickets. They do, they do, um, you ride out on horseback into the Grevy zebra herds. I think they also have giraffes and all, all kinds of, you know, uh, wild animals there. But that would be great to go and see them. And I would love to, you know, take some videos and so forth. Talk about like looking at herd dynamics as natural as it gets, right? Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Wouldn't it be so yeah. cool? It's, it's not as cool as Africa, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's not as far either. either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, somebody said in the in the Q and A, it's also the nature of humans not to be concerned for personal safety. I actually disagree. Perhaps more of a difference the fact that we are technically a predator. I also, you know, so I do I do have to do my little speech about predator prey okay Good, so yeah do it. For it. bringing up africa is the place to talk about it so i've been to africa many times 10 i've taken 10 groups now over i don't know how many years and um i think that the predator prey thing in, in the real world is not it's much more subtle and it's not what we think and by the way when you are in africa and you're on a horse you're the prey and so you know yeah. I, I I think what we have to look at is not so much predator prey, but vulnerability. Am I safe? Yep. That's our vagal nerve response, right? And right. and so, you know, like I always tell people if I used to say, you know, if I took you to New York City, when I was a kid, we had to go to Miller's because you had to go through the park where the prostitutes were to get to Miller's. And so, you know, who was the the pre well, I was terrified, right? I was scared. Of, oh my God, you know, because these women were like really scary. And, you know, and I always say that, that it's, it all depends on whether or not you have a tool and humans can make tools, which animals actually can make tools, but they can't make the kind of lethal tools we can. So when, when we think of predator prey, we are also prey and we are the pink yes. squishy thing yeah. without fur. Uh, at least I'm the pink squishy thing without fur. Um, and so you know, like my, that's one thing about going to Africa is your senses get so much heightened because of the vulnerability. When you get out, you're like, whew, I survived Africa, right? And so when you're in the environment, you realize that we, we surround ourselves with things to make us feel safe. Like my gigantic F-350, right? So I can I go down the road at 80 miles an hour in my F-350 and I feel safe because I'm bigger than almost everybody else out here. Right? That is a big truck. It's a big truck. But if I was in a little smart car and somebody like me drove past, guess who would be scared? <laughs> right? So I think we have to like step back from the predator prey thing and look at the mammalian response. We're as mammals, yeah. as somebody with a skeleton, we have a vagal response to safety. And I think that that's, uh oh, I think I froze. I guess, you know, so then six, we got very defensive. And then also, actually, we were watching a um, documentary about polar bears, which was very fascinating. And the polar bears are looking for food and they come upon the walruses. And there's a bunch of walruses and they're all laying on top of each other. It was so neat, actually, to see how they're so connected. Mm -hmm. And so the baby polar was trying to do basically her first hunt and mama comes over as well to help out. And what ends up happening is when mama shows up, they actually, all the walrus scatter and they were hoping that one of the, I mean, this caps, is the narrator of was saying like, I hope one of the mamas, like insecure mamas leaves her baby behind. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, bears got to kill. They got to kill. Right. But the the point of that is um, looking at how animals that are regularly hunted behave versus how hunting animals behave. And where I'm coming from for this, and you're absolutely right, because we're pink squishy things with no claws and crappy teeth. We can't even open our mouths that big. We can't run very fast, <laughs> nor can we climb anything. So really, without our devices, we're we're ridiculous. The only reason that we're surviving is because we can create stuff. Correct. But in relation to a person with a horse on a lead rope, walking that horse down the aisle of the barn and they open the door and it's bright light outside and the horse spooks. In relation to things like that, when I'm um, working with someone to help them understand what are the messages the horse is needing in that moment, you can coerce the horse, force the horse, get mad at the horse, smack the horse, say he's stupid and probably you can make him or force them to go out, but you haven't solved the anxiety. 
Right. And the anxiety is there because the horse, if another horse was there, the horse would follow the horse. So that's what I'm saying is when we're analyzing how horses function in herd dynamics, it helps us to understand what a herd dynamic is. Because if I take five people out, Wendy, into a paddock with five horses, the five horses generally will clump together, even if they don't do the walrus thing and lay on top of each other. But they'll generally, they become aware of where all the horses are and they make some choices about what they're gonna do. And generally the five people scatter and move around the herd and actually put themselves at odd positions so that if lightning was to strike, someone's gonna get run over by a horse. They like guaranteed every time. And, and people do not have, it's not in them even though we've been taught to walk in lines and stand in line as kids, you get in line to go to the, go to the cafeteria and go out, to da, 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 stick together, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as people have their own um, opportunity and they're in a field of horses, they just take off. And this happens over and over and over again. And it's not, there's, it's not inherent in people to stick together. And I always have to call out and say, you need to be a human herd. You need to find your other herd mates and you need to stick together. The horses need to know how to get around and you. And you all need to problem solve together. The horses need to know if lightning strikes, they need to know how to not run you over. And if you're all spread out and just um, in point in fact, I had some one person with me in the herd recently, this was a couple of months ago. And I said to her, stick to me. You do not be within, I need to be able to reach out and touch you at all times. And we're walking along and she'd fallen behind a little bit. And suddenly she's 10 feet away and literally a car went by and backfired and the horses spooked and they ran. And because of where she had to decide to split the herd to run around us, to not run her over. But one of the horses grazed me, the, the youngest one, the wow. one the she grazed with her shoulder at a dead run, grazed my shoulder as her way of going like, mom, you fucked up. And so I was like, I told my person to stay with, and she wandered off. And because it's not instinctive for people to think we need to stick together in this way. We are so individualistic. Do you think we've lost that because, uh, because of the trappings that we have? Like a, Maybe. A, of mine, a long time ago said the worst thing that ever happened to community was air conditioning. Mm. Hmm. Think about it. Because prior to air conditioning, you'd sit on the porch and you'd sit on your rocker and you'd talk to your neighbors. And the minute mm. we got air conditioning, we went into our houses and we lost the sense of, and I, you know, I've thought about that lately and it's like, wow, how true is that? Right. Mm. That we, because, because tribes like, and I'm going to go back to Africa. The thing that's so interesting that I love about Africa is that our crew is a, a community and we might have a chieftain of a tribe and you won't know it but the tip that we give them goes back to their community and they take care of each other. And so, you know, how much of this is actually um, a result of our society as opposed to our nature? That's true. Yeah, that's true. But I, I also think in the sort of uh, Northern European societal structure has been um, very isolationist, very individualistic for a long time. So I yes. wonder, we've kind of been bred to do this this way. We've been away from a tribal mind for such a long time. So I, you know, I wonder about that. I don't know. I don't have any answers for that. What I do know is it's predictable. It's predictable. Oh, yeah. that people, There's always a stray. They don't, they don't <laughs> stick together. It's very hard for people to, then they feel, they have this weird feeling that they describe often in my clinics. They're like, I don't like it. I don't want to stick to other people. I, I have want, a different idea. I have a different idea. I want to do my own thing. And it's like, yes. And that is going to fracture the horse herd. And and there and there you might say on some very very deep primal level, but if you're hunting a, a, a herd and a group of animals like like the polar bears were, you want to split them up, right? You want to get them moving. You want to break them up, and you want people positioned in different places to take advantage of the a split of and the find split. The, the weakest one. Have you ever been to Finland? Have you ever taught in Finland? I've not taught in Finland yet. No. Okay. So, so I used to go to Finland and do clinics. And the thing that I was so impressed with, with the Finns is, is that first of all, nobody there, you don't see this hierarchy of, of 
financial hierarchy. You, you, you could be standing next to a person who's a CEO and you could have gone to school with him and everybody's like the same. But the other thing is that at the end of a clinic, no one would leave until everybody helped clean up. It was a group effort. And they're very much, uh, when they have a meeting and they have to make a decision, they let everybody in the group say something before they make a decision and they make the decision based on the communication. Um, mm. There was a time when Siemens came in and bought Nokia, a portion of Nokia, and my my Finn friend had to work through the issues of the German company coming in. The Germans would make the decisions outside the room and then come in and just be done. And the Finns say it didn't work because the cultures were so different. But the Finns are a, a, a much more, it's changing, but back in the 90s, this incredible community sense. Um, and so, you know, it's it's fascinating what you're talking about because you know, I just think of different cultures and where uh, you might see this in a very primitive tribe, say in South Africa, uh, South America or something like that, but how much it's, we're losing it. We're losing, yeah, we're it. losing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then it's really hard for people to relate that horses' minds want to include everything and everyone in the environment as part of the conversation, part of what the reality that they're in, not just, I should follow you because you have me on a rope. Right. And for example, like a horse who is hesitant to leave their herd and they keep, you get them out of the paddock and they keep stopping and looking back. And they're like, what about my other, my other horses? Like they're concerned about the group. And especially if you have like a protector or a mentor, they're like, those kids, they might go play in the street if I'm gone. And so they actually like are concerned that the well being of the rest of the herd is going to be compromised because they're leaving. Right. And yeah. we had an interesting in the video that we did this morning, it was really, really interesting because as each horse moves through, we have this system where they can come out of their stalls and go through the indoor. And there's a side door off the indoor that goes into a grazing area. So it's really neat because you get to see them moving through different environments and how they navigate each of those environments. And as they move through this narrow door, they have to go one by one. And depending on which horse is fulfilling what role in the herd, they're doing different things. What's interesting when they get out to graze, that's a higher risk area because no one has checked it for bears yet, right? So Rocky's the first one out and he usually stands in the doorway and looks, right? And then mummy comes out and Je and her baby, who's 15 years old baby, yeah. sticks to her like, like, glue. like glue and goes wherever she goes and she's got her. And then Jagger is like sort of usually stuck behind Rocky waiting. So she bumps him in the, in the can I go now? Can I go now? And, you know, and he sort of, decides at a certain okay like, fine you can move by but it's interesting that's such a predictable pattern and he's watching he doesn't just run off and eat he typically stands and watches while mummy goes because mummy's the other leader she takes the baby and goes and says i'll check the perimeter while you watch you've got my back and jag is stuck waiting for anything to happen because <laughs> she's what we call a peacemaker peacemaker horses generally don't want to cause disruption they don't want much. They they don't need much. They're pretty happy go lucky, uh, but they don't want you to disturb their peace. So if you're like, let's trot, and they're like, that disturbs my peace. I don't want. <laughs> yeah, and so in Jag, it was Rocky, and then Jag a pole, and so um, Jagger was crammed behind Rocky in the pole, and then Mummy and Luna, and so Jagger was like, really, you could see her like, will someone please move? And Mummy <laughs> swishes her tail. And she's you like, no. Here. And so then Jag used her muzzle and touched Rocky on his hip to be like, can you move forward? And he wouldn't move. And Jagger's like, please, I want to get, it was like a little claustrophobic for sure. Yeah. Because like four or five feet behind Jag is the door to get back into the indoor arena. And so she literally goes and like bumps him with her chest that his hip, like, can you move? And he finally bump, like bump. begrudgingly <laughs> moved. You know, it's a, it was hilarious. That's all normal normal everyday stuff and, and anybody can see versions of that, right? If you've got a group of horses, you can see versions of them. But what we've been able to do because we're lucky enough to encounter herds all over the world in our workshops is see these certain patterns that are really predictable and understanding that those patterns also help horses to feel safe about their environment and to feel like they're a cohesive team together. So it's not just every man for himself. So I think one of the things that's been interesting to think about is 
if we could get into that hive mind more, if we could, every time you're looking at your a, a horse and you're saying, I want this horse to do this task, if you're thinking, well, who is this horse in the bigger scheme of things relational to this horse's herd? Are they someone that is a peacemaker and just, you know, just kind of hangs out and waits for everybody else to make decisions? Or are they a leader that says, I'll go ahead? Are they a leader that says, I'll stay behind and watch? You know, like what kind of positioning do they like to do? I think that it can help us to understand how the, um, what are the needs of that particular animal and how we can sort of come in as a, a group, as a group leader, rather than just, I want my horse to be obedient to me just because I want him to. And we're, we're luckier with, I mean, dogs have wild, wildly different personalities as well, but we're lucky with dogs that there's something innate in most dogs. Some dogs don't have this, but most dogs where they enjoy being trained. Most dogs that I've worked with, that I've trained, and I've trained a wide variety of um, breeds, most dogs really love to be given the explanation of where they should be and what they should be doing, but that's kind of innate to pack behavior. Whereas herd behavior is more like we, like what you're saying in Africa, like we collectively are gonna get this done. We're gonna keep each other safe collectively. So it's not a top down dominance thing, but a lot of our thoughts about horses have gone towards a top down dominance thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, how do I ask this question? In, when a horse is in a barn where there's dissonance amongst the people, how disruptive is that to this herd idea? I think that it depends on how cohesive the horse herd is. So let's say the herd of horses is a pretty solid herd. And then the herd of the human herd is uh, not so solid and they, they're bickering with each other. Well, then the horse may get some sense of security and well-being while they're out doing their horsey thing. But when they come in, the anxiety might go way up because that's what they're There's reading. Dysregulation this in dysregul the human herd. Right. And they're going to smell it. They're going to sense it. They're going to feel it. They're going to see it. They're going to see people's eyes bugging out and they're, they're gritting their teeth. They're aware of all those micro expressions. You know that if you, if you look at a face when they're studying micro expressions, they prefer to do it in 4K. Oh, interesting. So I was watching this thing about micro expressions. He goes, look at the difference between 1080 and 4K. Oh, I'm sure there's a giant And in 4K, you can see rippling under one eyebrow as someone shows surprise like Spock. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. But I, th I, th I saw that and I thought, I believe from my experience with horses that they may have, they're sort of having that 4K attunement to what our micro expressions are doing. Sure. Sure. And they're all, like you said, they're going to pick up on the smell, like the stress uh, and that sort of thing, because, you know, I, 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 it makes me think way, way back to a barn that I was in and, you know, the horses, you had to feed them a ton of food and yet they wouldn't put on weight. And then I pulled my horse and took it to another barn and he turned into a balloon. You know, the stress was keeping him from gaining weight and the, he was in a, in a herd, but I, I think it was the human stress. Yeah. That was around him. Yeah. Because as you know, Holly Vagel theory, you know, the, if, if you can't come all the way down into rest and repair, you're not going to do much with the food you're eating because you're just yeah. burning it. Right. So, you know, um, somebody, somebody asked where all the questions went. They weren't a lot of questions. They were a lot of people like trying to get the chat working and the temperature that they had. So um, I just, I just got rid of the answers that were not the questions that weren't questions, but there is a question is where is the zebra experience? I don't know where it is. It's, it's in North, Northern Florida. If PJ is here, she'll know. Because okay. PJ told me about it. Uh, what do you mean by 4K? It's the quality of the um, picture. So a typical, um, the new, well, there's new resolutions, but the 4K resolution is one of the top line versus like a 1080. So if you're on YouTube, you can actually change the resolution of your video. And so the lower the, the number, um, the grainier it is. Like right. our camera currently is not a 4K camera. No, this is probably a 1080. <laughs> and it's not, it's actually less than that. Oh, it's less than yeah, this right. one yeah because not. that's why I can upload them to, to YouTube so fast. Right. Yeah. Low and then resolution. We have a, at our office, we are running a 4K camera that we bought that we... You know, your iPhone is 4K. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you have, but you can opt, you can opt out of it. It's actually defaults to, um, defaults to the other one. It, you have right. To but I mean, that 4, 4k can. is a higher resolution and the televisions that handle 4k. And now I think it's coming out with 5k. If you ever look at the old movies that were filmed on a lower res, they weren't high res, they're all grainy. And then they have the square box yeah. around them. So that's basically the resolution. You can see a lot. Yeah. More. Right. Um, yeah. Like watching one of those ancient VHS tapes. They're yeah. very grainy yeah. versus yeah. a laser disc or DVD or now Blu-ray. So, so somebody's asking how you could speak at Pony Club. Uh, they want to, they want to know how how could you personally propose horse speak to Pony Club? Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. You know, that's Pony Club. Um, well, I've I've spoken at 4-H. Right. And they do have an annual meeting. You have to actually, I just applied. You have to apply to go and speak at their annual meeting. Um, Add it to the list. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to me, like the, I, I would put under, under a heading of, of equine management stuff, you know, like how to, how to have uh, safe equine management that also, that includes good bonding. So like boundaries and bonding or, or how to add enrichment to your horse's regimen or, how to have an enriching relationship, but not sacrifice safety, like things like that. Yeah. Um, so somebody, I think PJ answered north of Jacksonville. There's a wild herd of Somali ass. Um, somebody wants to go, that she wants to go observe it. It's white, ho white, I don't know if this is all supposed to be one word, PJ, whiteoakwildlife.org, because only the wildlife.org came through as a link mm. in the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. So somebody's asking in a stable situation where horses are let out one at a time to pasture, the thunder just rolled, would it be better to lead out a group together given each horse coming out doesn't know if the pasture has been checked out? Interesting. That's here's our question. here's our quick solution for that if it's possible to implement this. And it's so simple. This is what I love about horse speak. A little can go a really long way. When you're leading the horses out, if before you open the gate, you touch the gate in three different places before you open it. So you touch it, you breathe, you touch it, you breathe, you touch it, you breathe. <sighs> then you open the gate. <clears throat> when you turn, when you put the horse in, you've basically said to the horse, I've inspected. I've inspected this environment and you've given them a chance to redirect their focus onto what you're uh, what you're showing them, which is to inspect the environment. And we found that something as simple as that or taking them inside the gate and touching three spots on the fence. So touch a spot on the fence, walk two feet, touch another spot, walk two feet, touch. And when you touch it, you don't want to go like, you hello, take fence. A, a you, pause. You need to like, hi, fence. Hi, make fence. Sure you not the electric fence, right? Not the electric fence. <laughs> well, if you need a little extra zing, If you, need a, if you yeah. didn't have your coffee yet. You could you could um, put your foot on three stones. You could just stand there. You could just walk three feet, stand there, whew, and breathe out. But basically, you're signaling, I've inspected. It's okay. And what's really cool about that is our horses, who are our horses, they taught me horse speak. And I said, you know what? Let's do this. Let's go out and, and touch three spots before we turn them loose. And it was amazing, the difference. And it depends on the character that you have. Like, Jagger's the peacemaker. And Rocky is the mentor and typically in protector, he's like every role in the herd. And so typically I will bring Rocky out first and there's no problem to bring Jag, the peacemaker out. And sometimes I'm like, let's switch it up, which horses really like patterns and are not too much into switching <laughs> it up. Like, let's but do an experiment. I like to see, like <laughs> explore. And so Jagger is then hesitant on leaving the barn. If she's the first one out, she has to check in with the floor. She has to check in with all the other horses. She has to check in with it takes forever. everything yeah. and it takes forever. And so then she might actually not want to go outside without someone else. So then I decide, okay, instead of like elongating this experience, I'll bring Rocky out and let her hang out in the barn loose <laughs> while she keeps exploring put Rocky outside. I'll come back into the barn. She's still hanging out. I bring her right out. No problem. We don't have to check in with the floor or anything else. So it's just, it really is fascinating so to in, understand in, right. what in, role they are and how they react or interact with their environment, because it can either like cause extreme frustration 
or, or you can be easy. like, and then you can be like, aha, I get it. You really do need to check out your environment got it. Instead of like, come on horse, why aren't you walking with me? Oh, if I take a couple of extra moments, right. check in with different things in the environment, you feel much better about leaving it. And it helps with trail riding. So if you, if you have a sense of the horse that is more comfortable being at the head and another horse that's more comfortable being at the heel, because the head and the heel are the two lead positions. Right. And then all the other horses want a peanut butter and jelly in the middle. And some people get in a bee in their bonnet about, well, I want my horse to lead, but that horse may be the worst leader. And right. then and all the other horses are getting upset because Ned can't lead. <laughs> what are you crazy? <laughs> like they get, then they start pushing. And I'm sure you know first. this from trail riding in Africa, like you're out on these long treks. And horses have their position that they're comfortable in. And, and, if and it can change in the line, but the lead horse. I mean, the, there's this one Mushala. He's a he's a bowhead, and he is a lead horse, and he will just go. And then you'll see all the horses kind of form in different places. And then during the day, it will switch. And some horses might drop back, and other horses will move up. And so the always at the back is our Maasai guide. That's his job, right? So he's always at the back. But it's fascinating to watch how the her herd changes around even in a couple hour ride right yeah it's not just because they're going to the next camp um it, it, I, I you know it's it but it is really really interesting but the lead horse and the reason they are the lead horse is because they will lead right, right. yeah and they have a couple of lead horses michali being one has been a lead horse for quite a while um and so it's just really interesting and there was an, an event we had this is many years ago and one of the uh, guides was on a horse that was absolutely not a leader and he she really needed to go after the horse that had disappeared and her horse just flat out was like no way Jose that is not. and he's one of the best he was one of the best horses in safari after that but he was like no way Jose I am not leaving this group you, that horse could die over the hill I don't <laughs> <care."> <laughs> you're on your own people you are on your own i am staying with my buddies forget it and, uh you know so it is really interesting when you're on safari to to because it's such a, it's such a dynamic herd and there's all this changing of position and that sort of yeah. thing. Uh, really really interesting i liked it, what you said wendy about like you feel like there's a change within yourself and when you get out there in that from what I perceive you said at the beginning was like your sense perception start heightening Wait. because you are now out in the wild with very dangerous animals that you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And you're in a human herd, you're in a horse herd, you're with folks who know this landscape, but, by the way, but you're still meat on feet really, because you never know who's going to show up. Oh yeah. I mean, but you know, we've had lion close to camp. Um, there's not on my safaris, but there's been some, you know, they've never lost a horse. They've never lost a guest. <laughs> okay. Let me just say that. Good odds. <laughs> yeah. But there are, you know, things happen and it's so like our leader, you, you do what he says and you listen to him. And so, so there wasn't, this was not on my safari, but it was the woman I got the safari company from. There was a woman and she decided to go on walkabout until she left camp because you're never supposed to go outside of camp by yourself, okay? And this was many years ago, but the mouse, I picked her up and brought her back to camp and wanted to sell her back to them. Yeah, because this is, we're talking uh, 80s, right? Uh, when things were a little more wild, but it was like, you buy her back. <laughs> I don't know how they negotiated out of doing that, but you know, you don't walk out of camp. And then we have, we had another, this was my safari, we had one woman who was so out of her element that she would do things that actually put the rest of the group at risk. And it was a fascinating experience to see how we as a group had to shun her. We had to just mm -hmm. stop communicating with her because she would do things that, that were just really, really uncomfortable. For instance, uh, is there anything? Well, so, um, you know, you always stay behind the guide, right? The guide is the leader. So she would ride in front of the guide with her feet out of the stirrups and her legs over the saddle flaps. What? And if I said anything to her, she would say that I attacked her. Oh. Yeah, it was, she was just so out of her element. And it was, was so interesting to watch the group. I basically, you know, like 
she, she we were taking siesta and I was laying on the grass, right? Cause it was long lunch when we moved camp and she walks up to me and says, I'm going to walk over to those baboons. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And she says, see, you have attacked me again. I'm like, uh, the baboons are the one that's going to attack you, honey. Right. But it was such a fascinating experience to have someone so out of sync with the group. Uh oh, you froze. Are you there? It's on. But the the, don't, the baboons are going to eat your face. Yeah. Right? So yeah, that's wow. Really... That's really tough. So what? What ended up? How did they manage her? So um, basically, at one point, finally, Gordy had to put his foot down and. There was a, we were on the last day, we, it was a triple. We didn't see lion. It was like really early on. Now we see lion every single day. Um, and we were, we finally, they finally spotted some lion and we went out to the lion. We were in two different vehicles and we're watching this pride of lion. The, the female was pregnant and there was some younger cubs and stuff. And she said, I'm going to get out of the vehicle. And it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> I, it's a good thing I wasn't in her vehicle because I think I would have at that point um, had much her out. Yeah, um, <laughs> but they gave her books. Yeah, self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're because me. Oh, I mean, yeah. I dropped my iPhone out of the vehicle once, and so what they had to do was sandwich my iPhone between the two vehicles. And the minute the driver popped the door, because there were three lions right laying under a tree, and I dropped my, I was like, bloop, crap. <laughs> um. So they pulled up the other vehicle, like within like a foot of this one that I was in and the driver popped the door. And the minute he popped the door, the three lions stood up. I mean, it was like, that's, that's when, you know, you're not, you're not in Kansas anymore. And he crawled through our vehicle and he popped the door and he reached down and grabbed the phone and the other vehicle was in, in the block view. Right. But wow. the minute, because they don't see the vehicles as a threat, as long as the vehicles stay a box right right in kenya there's no right. hunting there's only poaching which is actually getting under control that fortunately due due to some incredible management um but you, we've had lion literally walk past the vehicle no problem brad could have reached out and pet them they were that close but you you know you stay inside the vehicle and it's amazing it's amazing i'm going back wow. in september 2023 if anybody Ooh. wants to go <laughs> i i would love to go yeah. yeah how long is it is it two nine weeks? days nine days yep yep so if anybody wants to go just you know pop me an email um and we'll send you the, uh, the guidebook and um it's but you the thing about it and this is when you see them in their environment we're the ones that, you know are are the strangers in their world right and you see them in their environment and you realize that you know like they're they're there's leopard around that have been watching you and you don't even know it, right? There's mm -hmm. lion around that have been watching. And, um, but it brings you back to the, to the basic functions of life. And so it, it crystallizes and clarifies in the things that are important. It's a, it's yeah. a really uh, fascinating <clears throat> thing. And so that's what I mean when, you know, in, in this society, we, we put all these trappings around us to make us feel safe right? To deal with what the horses do in community because we've lost community. Uh-oh. I've lost you. Uh-oh. I've lost the signal. It gets blipped out in the weirdest moment. All right. In this society, what? In this society, we, we shield ourselves with all these trappings and things to make us feel safe. Right. But what we're realizing is we aren't safe, right? It's a false sense of security and what we're lacking is community. And when there is um, a catastrophic event, we return to community, right? But it takes right. these catastrophic events for us to go, oh, how's my neighbor doing? Are they okay? Mm. Let me see if they were washed away in the flood, right? Um, right. And so it's just, it's fascinating to see how we've built a society that isolates us and yet, our instinct, our very nature is community. And we've lost the skill. We've lost the skill of community. Right. Right. And I think that's what we're we're circling back around. We're talking about the same thing. And one of the cool things about trying to understand how the horse has 
even if we force them to, we put them in boxes and they've lived isolated, it's still internally where their compass goes is to be part of a group. Uh, I think what I've seen happen to people who start to get it about being in that kind of group environment is something in the people changes for the better. Like they feel uh, a deeper, richer connection to the horse, but they also can perceive a richer connection to, to nature or even a, a more like subtle connection to people that they care about. It's like something in us um, we've, we've gotten very guarded, I think, on a lot of levels. And there's reasons for that. Absolutely. But there's also, there's also like, how do we then unguard when we want to be unguarded? Right. And so what you're, you know, what the Four Speak tribe is, if you will, is a sense of community and understanding dyna herd dynamics of which we are also. Yeah. Yes. And our herd is a non-judgmental judge we're a judgment-free zone it doesn't matter where you've come from in your horse horsemanship background or whatever is you come into this really supportive group mind where people are just wanting to love their horse have fun and get some things done and be open-minded about a lot of other great things like yeah. like surefoot <laughs> well, but that's it. See, it's all part of the inquisitive mind. So when you have yes. safety, you can be inquisitive and curious, right? And yeah. so when you know, one of my favorite sayings, and I can't tell you who, the guy who who said it, but we're wired for connection, but trauma wires us for protection. And whether yeah. it's right, I love that quote, and it's in my PowerPoint, but I can't remember who said it. And so, you know, with the horses that have had trauma, you see them defending themselves with the only right. way they can, with their teeth, yeah. with their feet, with their reactions, because they're now wired for protection because they've been had trauma. And until yeah. you can reestablish the community, the sense of I hear you. And I think the yeah. number one thing is I hear you. I see you. I sense you. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we establish that, that they that we see them as a, as a being, they can then begin the process of healing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like we have a values, we have six values in horse speak and three, there's three that are the top most when you have the, you're clear with your body language. So clarity, clarity, and protection, then safety, and protection and, safe, and safety. Those are the top three. And then when you can get those, have those three, then you can come to the connection and comfort. comfort and then we also include resources which can be like food water shelter things of that nature Absolutely, but yeah. then we strive to be a, a resource. resource the human is a resource for the horse so then if there is a spook the horse can resource off of us because we're going to provide the safety and protection and be clear and let them know yeah Let's check it out. What do you see over there? Oh, I see. Yeah, there is a lion over there. We should leave. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. Yeah. We were just, we were, I was just talking to someone recently um, who's, who's studying with us. And the problem that she had, this is really funny. Like when, when it, we went through this whole discussion at the end of it, we were all smiling because I said, you know what your problem is? Your problem is that your horse is now calm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's like, I can't. she used to, she used to just jump when I said jump. And now she looks at me and says, well, why? And, but your foot's in the wrong place. And, you know, she it's, we have this and she's like, and I, and I looked at the video and I'm like, she's doing everything you want, but yes, she is saying, well, your kind your body language is a little bit in the way of what you're really asking me to do. And, but okay, I, you're cute and I'm going to keep you. So I'll do what you're asking. And there's no problem. She goes, but she's not like, spunky like she's, she's not too. like leaping into the rafters of the barn oh, right so she's just looking over her shoulder like oh that coming. concerns me but yeah. and so then she, I'm like it's still her looking for safety and protection she's just not in a red it's zone more subtle now anymore right. and it was yeah. so funny to realize like holy cow your problem is your horse is calm and you're not used to managing a calm horse you know, that's, that's so funny because that's one of the comments I get with Surefoot all the time is like, my horse is standing. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> They're like, OMG, my horse is, yeah. I mean, it, it's standing still. It's okay. Everything's good, you know? Or, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that's one of the cool things. I mean, I liked the, the pads that you have that work on, on trauma 
I like when I stood on them, I noticed that my brain went way, way, way. It was really, really interesting. But do you know if those pads are sourcing uh, or are sort of working out? Is there a delineation between like it? emotional trauma or physical trauma or does the body just kind of group it together? I don't, I don't think you can separate it. That's I, from a Feldenkrais perspective, perspective of body mind, I don't think you can separate a physical and emotional and a mental trauma because they're so wired together. There's always a right. body element of all right. trauma, right? And right. so there's an emotional element of all trauma and there's a mental element of all trauma. So I don't think you can separate it. And you know, the beauty is, that's the beauty is you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> You're right. You don't have to. Yeah, I know we have some questions here. Um, someone says, can you talk about taking a mentor horse away from the herd or leading a horse who wants to be the lead horse and wants to be the have the person to be behind to be the protector? Uh, so if you're taking a mentor horse away from the herd, again, this is this sounds too good to be true and too simple. And, but it's really worth trying it out. If you pause like a sincere pause, not like how, like I wanna get through this, but you need to pause three times and make contact with an object in the environment because you're saying I'm checking things out before I make a change. So I'm checking things out before I make the change of putting you loose, uh, turning you loose into the paddock, or I'm checking things out before I make a change of taking the mentor away from you and we're leaving the paddock. So whatever, Whatever the change is that you're about to create, if you pause three times, three times is the magic charm. They do it too. So I didn't make this up. They they showed me. That's what they tend to do when they want to make a change and they don't want the herd to get disrupted. So that's pretty cool. As far as um, giving protection messages from behind, it's they they understand that we have hands. So if you're engaging your hand like a sign language and you aim your palm towards the hip, you're aiming your focus of attention through your palm. So you're focusing your attention to the height of their hip. They focus their attention to the height of another horse's hip to say, hey, I got you, I let the lion jump on your hip. So we're using our palm to demonstrate where our focus of attention is going. And that works really, really well for them. If you leave it up and you breathe out, and then you kind of slowly withdraw it. If you put your hand up and you go, I got your back, and then you put it down, it's not very effective because they don't know if you just swatted a fly. So you have to dem be demonstrative. Awesome. Okay, so next question. My horse wants to be the lead on trails, but at times something will spook him and he'll go to the end of the lineup. Then he'll want to go back to the lead when there's nothing to be afraid of. Why does he do this if he's an alpha horse? Well, that's getting away from the term alpha because alpha is a top-down dominant structure, which is in our language system. It doesn't really work for them. As Wendy was saying before, they change positions because there are horses that are good at, at one aspect of, of the trail and maybe not so good at another. Like one horse might be really good at crossing water, but doesn't want anything to do with any other decisions. So the herd will sort of step aside and let the water crossing horse do the thing. So that horse that's going to the front, he likes being in the front as long as nothing is challenging or scary. So he may like making the map. He may like knowing where we're going, sniffing the ground, taking in new sites. But if something's challenging or scary, he's not prepared for that. Another horse can deal with the challenging and scary things. So that's, it's really that simple that he's like, whoa, switch up here. Yeah, I can't deal, read. I can't deal with the challenging, scary thing. And you know, again, I, I can't help but keep going back to humans. We do this all the time, right? Well, somebody will start out in the lead and they'll be going great and they'll go, oh, you know what? I need a break. You go, you know, and it's, and we, ta I tag teamed riding teaching for six years with a friend and you'd walk in and go, you know, I'm tired today. You take over. <laughs> um, and we, and yeah. we uh, you know, I mean, that's part. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the big, big cat. Okay. Every horse I train, I teach the word touch pointing to the object. If the horse is frightened of an object, I ask it to touch the object. This has worked for me every time. This is more than a, of a share than a question from Tony Metzler. Yep. So when you're teaching to touch an object, there's usually a, a food reward that the touch that is a classic thing from uh, um, positive reinforcement training, the touch object idea. And that can certainly work. However, you're also putting the horse in the frame of you touch it first. So let's just think about from the, from the herd mind, if the mother horse goes out into the field, she doesn't tell the foal 
Hey, go look at that log. See if there's bees. You go touch it. Go see if there's bees in that log. Hey, I think I smell a bear. Why don't you go check it out? The mother says, you stay still or stay by my side while I inspect it and check it out. So the functional difference in the two um, the two concepts is if you're touching the object, you're saying, I am the mama, I'm the mentor, I'm, I'm up here in the pecking order because I'm protecting you. And that not only gives the horse the sense of I've got it covered, but it also gives a sense of you'll take responsibility, you'll be the protector, you're providing the safety, so you're really making sure everything's okay. Um, teaching them to touch an object, horses have natural innate curiosity. So if you get to combine that curiosity with a reward, that can function as, okay, I'm going to get a reward for touching this. It doesn't mean you've removed the anxiety or that you've changed your orientation in the herd mind or that you've provided safety and protection for them. It just means you've engaged their curiosity to help them feel like, well, well anything in this environment might get me a reward which can work but only to a degree uh, when I've known people that that works but then they still have a horse who's anxious on the trail or they still are anxious in this place or that place and we switched to doing some of the prote protection and safety messages then she she knew when it was time to tell the horse to touch something and when it was time for her to touch something depending on what the needs of the horse were in the moment okay I'm, I'm not sure I understand the next two comments so I'm going to jump down um, same in the U.S. When you're riding with your and your horse senses a threat or a coyote, and the rider thinks they're being difficult, yeah, um, you know th their sense of smell is so much stronger than uh, ours. Uh, they actually, oops, sorry, just dropped my laptop. Um, have have a nose that's as uh, can sm it's like a dog. It can yep. it actually use them for scenting. So the horses are going to pick up on smells way before we ever will. So it's oh, kind of Wendy, yeah, yeah. I get it. The big cat heard the tuna can open. That's in reference to the car door opening in the Savannah. Oh, then, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's human tuna. <laughs> Ooh, the can box. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, some good things about this past two years of the webinars with Wendy and Sharon. <laughs> Thanks. We really appreciate that. Yeah, we do. It's, it's a more of a challenge than others now to keep them going, but uh, you know. We do appreciate that you, um, okay, Temple Grandin said we have, we co-evolve with dogs because dogs know how to be a member of a pack. I wonder if it applies to horses. You know, I think it, you have to look at the cultures where horses were, that you, you're you going to have the horses in certain cultures and not in others, right? So um, look yeah, at like the Arabians. The Native Americans that had the Appaloosas that would come into their teepee. Right, they bred them for that. So I, my answer to that is that in cultures, that had horses for thousands of years, I have noticed that a lot of our body language might be somewhat co-opted from theirs because there's a lot of tail messages that we do with hand gestures that people just accidentally do. Like, it's really like this, like, eh, that's a tail swish. Oh, it is. It's totally a tail swish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm rocking it. This yeah. is like, yeah. Yeah. It's being all sassy when or, they're doing or massage, their tail is going like that. Or how many times, you know, there's a joke in movies or whatever, when a guy sees a hot looking girl, he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, that's a, that's a stallion. That's yes. the sound he makes. I mean, there's a lot of interesting correlations because um, humans make such precise facial expressions and so do horses. The shape of their head is totally different. So it's hard for us to recognize face because we, we see this elongation and we can't recognize it. We're thinking faces round with eyes, like a dog looking at you or a cat looking at you looks like a face to us. But horses have lips like our lips, they move like ours move. So they actually make more facial expressions with the lips and the chin like we do. Cats and dogs can't, they have fixed, fixed mouths and long elongated lips in the back because they have fangs. So they don't make all of the nuances that horses make and all of the expressions in our cheek, our eyes, horses don't have eyebrows, but they have that over the eye. They do have over the eye. You know, I, I don't know. I had one, I had a quarter horse, a Hollywood done it. a really well-bred quarter horse, reigning, reigning horse, but she had a box for a muzzle and she did not have a prehensile lip. So, you know, Andy who could unlock anything and, you know, do it, but she had that. So she was like, didn't have all those 
kind of mouth expressions. She did it other ways. <laughs> you know, I've uh, noticed that so sometimes when that there was a um, a futurity reigning horse that was a he was a champion reigning horse that I was lucky enough to ride. I learned a lot from this horse. He was really got me excited about reigning and just sort of the whole. I went through a phase. I went through a big phase with this horse because he was so freaking talented, and I was like able to ride this smooth stuff. But he had a box for a mouth and he also was expressionless in many other ways and kind of weird, like maladapted because he lived in a stall for 23 hours a day and was just ridden and then put back to the stall. And finally, we were able to con you know, convince the owners, like, can you, because they're not riding him that way anymore. Can you pull his shoes? Can he go outside? He didn't know what to do with rain or bugs or anything. Oh, wow. And I always used to say he makes me think of someone who's mute because he didn't make a lot of expression. But I wondered how much of that was being isolated. Uh, I certainly are part of it. And the problem is you can't turn horses out with sly plates. I, no, I did can't. that by mistake and it was really bad. Yeah. You know, I mean, so there's a, the, um, anyway, but, but she, she was fascinating because, you know, she just didn't have any lip dynamics. Right. But she was an, uh, very intelligent mare. Um, PJ Rossi saying a horse's olfactory bulb is the size of a Tootsie roll lollipop. Ours is the size of a one inch stick the size of a of one inch of a stick there's no physical way humans can process the information horses can we don't have the hardware yeah yeah cool yep. it's good to know size matters <laughs> <laughs> okay so somebody says uh it is a very welcoming community it certainly is um so the pad, pad is a trauma pad right so typically the physio pad or the hard orange pads um you don't want to. You don't want too much yeah. instability, because it can be disturbing. So you know, like you you start there, and actually, there's some there's some reasons I think why that material works the way it does. I, I won't go into it today, but I that is the one that I've seen very interesting responses from both horses and people. Yeah, nice. Absolutely. Uh, we even say to a person, well, uh, "Put your foot down." Yeah. Yeah, horses do that. Yeah, they're like, I'm done. Yeah, yep. we have a lot of sayings and expressions yep. from them. So I, I, I think that the, it, there's a there's interesting stuff about us and dogs, but there's interesting stuff about us and horses too. I think we'll have to save that for the next time. Yeah, and you know, I, you you have to wonder. So you know, horses have been with humans for a very long time, especially in certain cultures, and. You, you know, in the, in the times that we have now, there's more and more pressure on the horse industry in the United States. In Europe, they have integrated horses more into society. It causes other pressures on the horses because they don't have the kind of turnout that we can provide them here, but it does keep the two species together. And there, there's such a, a strong relationship between humans and horses that I think it's so important. We're, we're moving now to a stage where we have to really think about welfare. And horse beak and surefoot address welfare. And right. it's so important that we get this message because if we don't, the the societal pressures that are not involved with horses will come to bear on the equestrian community. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I just think it's really important that we keep educating and we keep pushing forward on the on the sure. things that bring about greater understanding and welfare. Uh oh, you froze again. Oh no. Are you going to come back? Uh, are you there? That, that's yeah, awesome. That's cool. Oh, you're back. All right, darling. What is your final word? Uh, <laughs> she just I, said it. I just we missed said it. it. She did. she did. She closed it. That was done. She was done. Oh, I thought and she so, had the last thing to um, say. You can find more out, more about Horsespeak at SharonWilsey.com or you can visit HorsespeakAcademy.com. Uh, we have a third book called Essential Horsespeak that just got released. Is it out? Month. Is it out yeah, now? Yeah. Yes. 
So you, um, you can support our local business by going to horsebeakacademy.com or you can go to the Amazon beast. Um, <laughs> That's subtle, very subtle. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we're, you know, happy to be, we also have offer a club on Tuesdays, which is great. It's $30 a month and you can submit your own videos. So then you can get one-on-one -on -one coaching live during the show. It's super. And uh, yeah, we're always learning and growing and uh, hope that you want to learn more about horse speak. Absolutely. And I've come out with the, the first workbook for Surefoot, workbook number oh, one. Cool. Oh, yeah, I, I finally got it out. So it's available now. You can go to shop.surefoot.equine.com and um, and order the workbook. And that, that getting really great reviews on it. People are loving it. So it's really awesome. Great. Sounds stunning, darling. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks to all thank three you. of you for sharing your knowledge. You have enhanced my relationship with my horse. Just great. ordered my Surefoot pads that my chiropractor suggested. Super. I'll be buying horse speak books. Oh, Yay. Thank, you, Denise. Thank, thank you, Denise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Right. That's why we love teaming up with you, Wendy. Yeah, we scratch each other's back. Oh, we hey, back. we're both gonna be in um we're both gonna be on Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. Yeah, I know. Right? We so, have some communication to do, not in a public forum. No, but I'm just saying we're yeah. we're both gonna be on the island with Laura. Well, I think Laura's gonna be on the other Laura on the yeah. island at the same time. So we're we're gonna yes. something. It'll be fun. We should do a live broadcast from there. Oh yeah, that's what a good idea! Yeah. yeah, yay! So we'll do we're that. Even, we're even crazier. Stay tuned for that one, folks. That's going to be in September. <laughs> yes. All right, all right, Wendy. Thanks. Thank Take you, care, everybody. Bye. Have a great night, y'all. Thank Bye. you for being here. Cheers.